I think you've said 20% of all writers are really good and 10% are great. That's what I saw when I was doing the HBO Access program. So we would get in our, every year we had about 3,500 submissions to our writers program. And when we did the math, we found that 20% of those writers were all good. They were good. 80% of them were probably just not ready, right? But 20% were good. And any of those 20% could or should be working in the business. And they came from everywhere, all demographics. 10% were really good. 10% are all people who were very worthy of, of being in the program. So it's not that the talent's not there, the talent's there. And I wonder, and I've, I've actually had conversations with, with people before about this, you just wonder if, again, the access is the barrier to entry. If, yeah, there's, there's gonna be some part of that, some, some piece of that that's gonna be, a fraction of those people won't work in, in a writer's room. They're probably feature writers, or their interest is someplace different, or they wanna do animation and we didn't do animation at the time, or they wanted to do children's and we didn't do children's. So there may be other factors that count them out, or they're emotionally not ready to take that next step, which is a very valid thing. And I applaud anybody who understands that about themselves. But of those of that 10%, those people, again, come from everywhere. They come in all ages and all um, genders. And you just wonder how many of those people are out there in the world who just don't have the entry point. They don't have the access. And because they don't have that access, they they give up. You know, how many people, how many stories are we leaving on the sidelines that aren't getting through because they're not getting the encouragement? Which is why when we were doing our program, when we even went, we did our semifinal cut, we, we put blasted that information out there because all of those semifinalists had jumped over so many hurdles and we knew that they were, you know, great voices, valued, you know, um, could be potentially, you know, working in this, in this industry and they all needed to be recognized. They all needed their, they all needed their little day in the sun because what happens is when, when HBO then puts that message out there, all the agents come looking for them. They see their names. They're like, they, we look them up on, online and reach out directly. And all those people get then a little bit of lift. But yeah, there's a lot of talent out there. And you just wonder how many stories haven't been told that should be told. When you say emotionally ready, what does that mean? When I say emotionally ready, I mean that sometimes you can get to a place where you have the path, the door is open to you but you aren't necessarily ready for all that it entails. Being a working writer in this industry is not easy. Once you've gotten the gig, it's you're still putting in hours and you're still writing on the side because you need another piece of material and you still have to work with other people in a writer's room, right, on the TV side. Or you still have to navigate what it means to be a writer and, you, and sometimes that the not knowing where your next meal is coming from is not easy to to understand or to to stomach and then there are other things so whether you are you know this about yourself or you don't you in order to sit in a writer's room and to contribute without over contributing um, sometimes we don't all have the same skill set emotionally we don't have the right tools emotionally to take all of that on it is a it is a thing so that's when I say emotionally you have to be ready for it because once you are stepping onto that train as a working writer, it can be a lot. There have been times where people come out of a program and they go, you know what, I'm not going to be, I realized in the program that I don't love this process and I would rather go direct or I would rather go write novels, or I'm actually not fitting, I don't see myself fitting into this world in this way. 
or I'm dealing with my own stuff and it's hard to deal with and I need to take a break or I need to take a step back and that's okay. Not everybody gets to the, the starting line at the same time. And I do think that what we ask of writers is an emotional work. And if you're not ready to expose that, you got to do it at your own pace because you can damage your soul if you are not ready. So you have to figure out a way to be okay with it. And remember, you're getting criticism, constant criticism, whether people are saying it in a nice way or not and how you internalize that. And if you're okay with that, then you're good to go. And if you internalize that and you cannot, you cannot make sense of it and you need to do some emotional work, then sit it out for a minute until you're ready. So do you think that's a rare individual who realizes, wow, this big door is open for me and I'm actually not ready and I'm going to turn it no, down? No, I don't think it's unusual because I've, I've encountered quite a few people who, who get that, who know, who understand that. And, and I think that uh, when you've got to that place where you are, people are starting to set those meetings, it clicks in pretty quickly. Your fight or flight goes, oh, the, the sensors go off pretty fast. Like, I don't think I can do this. This is making me too uncomfortable. So I do think that there's a little bit of a pressure point that just goes haywire. And that's good. Then, then you got to figure out another way. And do you think because so many of these writers, they hone their craft outside of school on their own, whether at the library, coffee shop, in their room, and now it's a totally new ball game with input and agendas and personalities? And they weren't prepared for that? Well, I think also remember that uh, beyond all that, and that might, be, that might be true, sometimes when you get into a writer's room and you are dealing with a lot of criticism, and you, let's just say you have a funky writer's room, which a lot of people, we saw in the last couple of years, a lot of people had to go through. There's misogyny, there's racism, you know, there's, uh, there's so many other things that are coming at people that have nothing to do with the work. Sure. Teacher's pet. <laughs> you got to figure out a way to hold on. And I had a conversation with a, with a writer, um, Kathleen McGee Anderson and I had a, had a breakfast um, at the Beverly Hills, what's it, Beverly Hills Deli? What's the one that's at the top of Van Nuys, whatever that deli was? Beverly Glen Deli, years ago. And this was back when she had just wrapped Lincoln Heights. And she said, I'm really concerned that that we are losing a lot of our black female writers, that they just can't, that it's so hard to be in a room and you're the only one. And so we started a, a group and we got, and we did it for a couple of years where we got, a, and I was at NBC at the time, we got a lot of senior level, we had I think three or four senior level writers brought a mid-level and a junior writer. And it was to foster more mentoring and to give them some place where they could, they could a soft place to land, essentially, a, a, a touch point. Because we needed people to wrap their arms around the people who are coming up and go, oh yeah, they're gonna call you the diversity hire. Whether you were or not, they're gonna try to shame you into that. And they're gonna wanna touch your hair and they're gonna wanna throw racial up that said to you and they're gonna wanna, you know, push your buttons and they're gonna try to undermine you. And that was just very, very common, probably still is. And navigating that takes a lot of emotional fortitude. Now, I've been the diversity gal, so I've had a lot of stuff slung at me. I don't, I've don't. i got tougher skin than a lot of people, so I think I could probably weather it, but it wasn't easy getting there. There was a lot of times that I would go home and just be emotional wreck because nobody wanted to see that coming. Nobody wanted to see the diversity person coming because... I was always there to tell somebody that they're racist and they probably were, but then I wasn't the, you know, I wasn't very well liked in that role. Personally, I could be, have friendships with them, but, but they're not looking for that, right? They're not looking for that criticism. So it gave me a tougher skin than maybe some other people. I had a network executive. I had to be, had a, a tough skin. So, um, but not everybody starts there. You develop that as you go along. You create it, you know? Can you develop it without becoming bitter? 
Oh, sure. I think you can. I think, I think it's hard. I think there are times when you're dealing with it, but, but that's a bigger, that's a bigger question because, you know, it, it goes way beyond Hollywood. We're living in a time when we are seeing the rise of it, but we never really left it. We, you know, my parents went through the sixties and, and so there's always been strife. There's always been struggle before that we've, we've, we've had struggle here for, you know, 400 plus years. That's not going to go away. And then mix in every other culture that's tried to assimilate here and try to get a foothold. So there's going to be a sense. I mean, what, what does James Baldwin say to be black man, black, to be black in America is essentially to be in a rage all the time. There's like, I'm paraphrasing terribly, but to be in a, a rage all the time. And that's, of course, that's part of it. It's an undercurrent because we are looking for fairness in a place that fairness doesn't exist, nor does anybody want there to be fairness. You know, the people who should be, should be fair are not fair, right? So we're constantly struggling. We're constantly looking for a place to exist peacefully and do the best work that we can against terrible, terrible odds. But that's part of it. That's part of where we are. I, I, uh, I've, I've, I had a conversation, the very first conversation with, with my boss at NBC, a woman, amazing woman named Paula Madison, and she sat me down for lunch and she said, though almost the very first thing she said at this lunch, it's so seared into my brain, was she said, make no mistake, this is a civil rights job. This is civil rights. That's what we're doing in diversity, right? And I think of my role as a diversity executive and, and I think in, in my place in that world, it's funny because a, a, a young man just asked me about this recently in the last couple of weeks. And I said, we are part of a chain. We are just one link in a chain. And the chain stretches out way far behind us and way in front of us. And we're not going to fix this in our lifetime. It won't be over but we are doing our part because we cannot allow the chain to break. We have to keep going, right? So if you think about all the people who came before us, there's been terrible, terrible atrocities. And I know that we're going, we're like going off script here, right? In, in the, our conversation, but terrible, terrible things have happened. And we keep standing on the shoulders of those who come before us. So I'm standing on the shoulders of, of my boss and her predecessors and, and a long legacy of people. And there will be people who stand on my shoulders as well. So yeah, there's going to be some bitterness because it's not fixed yet, but that there's also a lot of other things that come into my daily existence. I'm not all bitter. That's not my, I don't wake up feeling bitter. I wake up and I do the job that I'm tasked to do. I create material. Hopefully I, I come to the material and try to create something that then again, you are touched by that then bridges that gap between us just a little bit more. And that's the job. That's my job right now. So you can't, you can't live on bitterness. You have to get up and do your job every day. You got to go make something happen. So there's a, there's a time and a place to, to be angry and to fight back, but then there's another time and a place to say, okay, I'm just going to focus on the task at hand and I'm not going to... But they might be one and the same. They might be the one and the same. So every single script that I write has a black lead, black female lead so far. Um, <laughs> I actually had a conversation with a friend of mine who was like, she was reading my scripts. She's really, really great. Um, uh, uh, um, I don't know. She, she, she helps a lot of people with their material. And, and I hadn't written in the, my description that the lead was black. And she says, well, you have to write that in. She said, otherwise we assume it's white. And I said, why would you assume that? Why would you assume that? It's coming from me. And a lot of other writers that I know who are of color are like, why would you assume that? Um, but that assumption is really like, it just gets it, gets to me. And I'm like, don't ever assume that about me. You should have to assume the opposite. And that if I tell you that the character is white, then <laughs> that character is white. But again, I feel like there's like all of this stuff that goes into, um, into how 
I'm presenting my material. My material is by its very nature advancing the cause. It's putting another perspective out there. It's showing you that this other character, this character can be whoever she is and navigate the world. So that's part of it. It's all part of it. And by the way, the first script that I wrote that got into Sundance was all about bitterness. She, the character was like a Joy Reid kind of character and she was on a tear the whole time. And I likened it to being how I sound in my head all the time. That's not every character I have. Not every character's like that. But there's an element of just by that character existing in the world, just by people reading that script, just by who, sh who I'm putting out there, that's also advancing the cause.